How about some fighting words for deer hunting? You know, we, we as deer hunters, we get so passionate about what we do that, uh, you know, you, you, you argue you know, amongst, amongst each other. And uh, this one's more ethical. This one's harder working, you know, public land versus private land. I see that a lot right now because there's a lot of interest in public land. It seems like it's picked up um, people going out and they've got to be much more holier than thou, you know, when it comes to private land and private land hunters work harder than public land hunters. You know, what, what's, where's it all come to? Both are, you know, both can be a great hunter, public land, private land, and it really doesn't matter in the end. And a lot of these don't either. And I kind of want to go through some of these just to offer a different perspective for you if you, if you have a negative view on any of these. Um, because I don't and and I'll tell you why and they are some buzzwords and I think if we talk about some of these and you understand some of these buzzy buzzwords it'll make more sense you know back in the day this is um, early 2000s I spent a lot of time on my own dime going around the UP of Michigan there's an, an antler referendum on there and people would say well if we have QDM up here that's what they referred it to then we're gonna shoot all the does and that was the you know, the DNR saying no that's not gonna happen that's not possible that's not going to happen but then you'd have UP whitetail groups saying no this is going to happen and they'd misinform, misinform their their uh, uh, membership base and it, it pushed a huge divide bottom line is it was right around when it got support at like 64 percent 63 percent but because it didn't have a super majority of 67 percent it didn't pass so two-thirds of people supported the measure and it was very interesting we we'd had, I'd go into a, a group and it might be it was some XYZ city, small city up in the UP of Michigan. There might be 40, 50 people there. Sometimes there are over 100. And I'd have a flip chart. I graduated to a, a uh, transparency machine, a projector. And uh, finally, on my own dime, bought a laptop and a PowerPoint projector so I could give a more effective talk. Gave talks, dozens of talks, um, whether it was setting up new QDMA branches or branch meetings, co-ops, and then certainly all these meetings. But it was interesting, these meetings, you'd have a piece of paper on the way in. And it's, it'd be, do you support this? And it'd be 30% support, 50%, 40% support. And then on the way out, it averaged 85 to 90% support because once people were informed of someone else's opinion in a logical manner, then it changed minds when they weren't hearing it from the same negative source and misinformation source all the time. So I'm hoping this offers a little bit of that in this conversation. Uh, depending on what you think. Cell cameras, we'll start with that. I have a friend, a good friend. Let's just say his name starts with a C. We'll just leave it at that. And uh, uh, love this friend. Been friends for a long time with him, uh, going on 20 years. And um, he can't stand cell cameras. Guess who just bought two? And guess who is going to have to download the app? And guess who wants help setting them up? And kind of like, I just don't believe in them, but... I got a good deal on these and uh, it'll be fun to set them up in the woods and just see what's going on. You know, look at all kinds of wildlife. You know, you kind of justify it. Like this would be cool to watch the seasons go by and the leaves fall down. And, uh, and I will say yesterday, just on a side random thought, yesterday I was sitting last day of Wisconsin's uh, muzzleloader season. So gun tag expired yesterday, didn't fill it. And fill it about 70% of the time, 60% of the time. So it was disappointing, but it was a really pretty set. Got to see some does, and it was the weirdest thing. Just enjoying the afternoon. I even sent Dylan a picture of, of the set, and it was really pretty. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, um, it was, I think what it was, was a, uh, a popple leaf that I don't, it must have been sitting up on some crotch of a tree because most of them have already dropped. And all of a sudden, just nothing else going on, dead quiet. It just swirled like this. And it seemed to take like 30 seconds to get to the ground right in front of me. And it's amazing the things that you appreciate in the woods. Imagine like this dark gray and not much sun out, not seeing a lot of deer. And then you just have this beautiful yellow leaf spiraling down like a parachute. And I don't know if I was going crazy or not, but I just thought that was pretty cool. Stupid seen, little thing. Uh, American Beauty. It's like when he's like filming the plastic bag. It's like, oh, you know, just like a <laughs> plastic bag. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess uh, the simple minded are easily a confused or amused, whatever way you want to put it. But anyways, um, completely random. But cell cameras, you know, this person talked about enjoying wildlife, enjoying nature. But really, he's, he's interested in getting that out there and just seeing what's going on with the deer herd. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um why does it really matter? Now, I can understand when it starts causing fights. I know it's caused fight. I don't know if it's Idaho where 
people are filming the same, or Utah, they're filming Arizona. the same, Arizona, Arizona maybe, Utah, maybe. Where they're filming the same water holes, multiple guides. And so there's almost fighting people, destroying trail cameras because there's 26 water holes, literally uh, several cameras. I think it was a dozen or more on the same water hole watching for wild game to come in there. And then that, that was an area they could put, uh, they could put uh, clients as an outfitter or guide. And uh, I wanted to offer that just because you see these things happening on your land doesn't mean you can go kill the deer immediately. In fact, what happens with cell cameras, anything, trail cameras in general, is the act of putting those in certain places and maintaining those, um, even the best of them, they might last several months with good batteries in the location. You can put solar panels on them. But then you have solar panels on that are shiny. If they're pointed the wrong way, they can tick, pick light up and you can rest assured a mature buck will pick up that. It's amazing how many people with a trail camera, cell camera or not, get a picture of one deer and then they don't get it again. That happens time and time again. I'm not saying the cell cameras don't help people sometimes, but they do hurt people sometimes too. They hurt hunters. They hurt your level of success. Any trail camera can do that. Could be the red flash. If you have a red flash bulb on your, your cell camera going off and spooking game, could be that you're putting it right at face level, right in front of a deer and they notice that box, they run off. And I bet you there's mature bucks out there that see that box from the side, don't get their picture taken and they never come by there. So the cell cameras, more of that instant gratification, our society nowadays, but I think the benefits of being able to watch game and understand and learn more about deer behavior, it's, it's not as easy as you think. You get a picture of a big buck, you just run out there and shoot it. That doesn't happen. In fact, I think what it does, and, and I run into this with multiple cell cameras in, in Minnesota and Wisconsin, where we see a picture of a deer and it tends to make, uh, help us make decisions that go against us because like tonight, I'm talking about Dylan. Well, we're not seeing Bo. Where, where's Bo at? Well, we haven't seen him for a couple of years. So where's he at? We start going through the camera pictures. And I think sometimes we end up making decisions. Like right now, um, if we're hunting cell cam pictures, we might be hunting a ghost. We're always playing catch up. On the flip side, if we're hunting sign and doe herds right now and doe numbers, then that's going to give us a smarter decision. But if you have a cell camera and you have a picture of a big buck, that kind of overrules doe pictures sometimes in your brain and psychological, whatever it might be. And so instead of making smart hunting decisions, sometimes we end up making decisions based on a cell camera, which can lead us astray. And uh, again, we're always trying to play catch up, not saying they don't help, but they do just as much harm probably with an equal amount of people as they do help. And bottom line is they're really cool. I like watching them for behavior. I like watching them for just how random buck movements can be how bucks disappear for a few days, where do they go? Because when you start looking at information like that and trying to decipher it and you ask yourself why, that's when we truly learn. If you just look at it like buck is at this spot, so I'm gonna go shoot him there, you probably won't. But if you look at it, he's at this spot, he's at this spot, he's not anywhere for a week. What's going on, where did he go, why is he leaving? That's when you learn. That's when you learn about the habitat on your land, where it's lacking, and it's pretty cool when you talk to neighbors too and get their perspective because it's pretty cool you, you think, man, I, I don't see this buck anymore. My neighbor, it must be over my neighbors. They're going to shoot him. And then you realize they haven't even gotten a picture of him all year. So where did he go? And, and so that's what's mystifying to me and, and, and as someone that's in the field helping clients, you know, like this year will be 84 days, you know, very strict on that. Dylan will probably be 70, 80 days in the field helping clients. Uh, Joe and Kevin will be about the same. So as collectively, we get to share information and talk about it, but you get to learn every time you're out in the field and you're, you're learning from your clients and what they're telling you. And this is a valuable tool. It can give you a lot of information on deer behavior and mature buck behavior that you can learn and apply other properties, wherever it might be. But if you think you're going to immediately see a buck and go out there and shoot it, you're, you're not. And you really have to be very, you have to treat these just like every other trail camera. You can't let deer see it. You can't go and put it in invasive areas where you go, have to go in and out and change batteries, cards. You can't have infrared bulbs flashing in the, in the eyes of a deer. You have to hide these things and make sure they don't become a distraction at the same time for making smart hunting decisions. So it's a good balance. And that smart hunting decision, that's something that people battle with for years to come. It doesn't really matter. It's not like 20 years from now, there'll be a tried and true list of don't do this, do this when it comes to cell cameras. And people have to figure that out on their own. I mean... Look at, you can pee in the woods, folks. We pee in our scrapes all the time. We can pee in the woods. You know how long it talk, took for, people still talk about don't pee in the woods. And I can see, like, I understand some of the pee bottles now and blinds. People don't want to open the door, spook deer. 
so they pee in a bottle and they're blind, but boy, you can just pee right off a stand. And, and you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about the urine spooking deer, but people still believe in it. It's been something that people have followed for decades. Let's talk about a deer track real quick. You know, there's, just talking about things, you have this deer track that's splayed out, and I, I know I'm a terrible artist, but, and then you have the dew claws back here, digging into the ground. People look at that and say, giant buck. That is a giant buck track, it's huge. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but, uh, but you saw it, and it was a year and a half old doe, yearling, not a fawn, medium age doe, just running. And so when it went in, it slipped, left its tracks down because it was slipping, and people say that's a giant buck track. People still look at that. Most of my clients, there's a big one right there. And I don't have the heart to say, no, that was a fawn. You know, it looks like a fawn, it slipped when it was running. And, and uh, But bottom line is there are a lot of things that people hold on to, and the same with cell cameras, they're gonna hold on to this for years, that cell cameras help people, they hurt people, whatever it might be, but it really takes using them to understand. And I think my friend's gonna have a big eye opener when he actually starts using them and applying them. And, He's pretty cool because he's very scientific and it'll actually, I think he'll really enjoy the behavior aspect of bucks and deer in general, let alone other wildlife too, that uh, he'll learn more about and become more familiar with. Crossbows. It's interesting because coming from Wisconsin, that was a state where crossbows came into effect. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to be guessing, let's say 2015. Dylan, do you know the number? In there. Yeah, yeah I, I remember I was at uh, Matthew's trade show down in the Dells, and uh, Scott Walker, the governor, was there, and they were announcing that you know around that time. Um, so I, I don't remember when that was, 2015, 2016. Bottom line, it's been quite a few years now, seven, eight years, that crossbows have been legal in Wisconsin, Michigan. It was before that, and Ohio was before Michigan. And in each of these states, about 50% of all hunters use crossbows. Could be 45, could be 43, could be 53. But bottom line is there's a high percentage of your hunting brothers that either use them or don't. And so you need to look at it that for one, it's accepted. Um, I always go back to Eric Eastman, his family owned uh, Carbon Express, um, Game Tracker, I think was there, the Game Tracker, String, String Tracker, Gorilla Tree Stands, you know, back in the day, that was all their stuff that's been recently sold like maybe four years ago, three years ago. Eric told me his, his dad, Bob Eastman, He's hunted African game with a bow, stick bow, everything all around the world. And it was back in the 70s, the compounds started coming out. And it was at Deer Camp in Michigan. And they, as a stick bow hunting deer camp, said if you bring a cross or a compound to deer camp, you're going to be kicked out and you're not going to be allowed to come. You can't come if you bring a compound. You know what happened in 10 years? Every one of them had a compound. And he referred to that as crossbows, that they become so widely accepted. Now, I don't think that it's going to be like that, where 100% of people are using, comp not 100, but 90% are using uh, crossbows. Because there's a certain joy that becomes eliminated when you use a crossbow just for going out and shooting. I know Dylan, we might shoot videos at 9 or 10 or whatever when he stays the night and we're going to shoot videos the next day. He'll have some coffee and go shoot his bow. And he, he just loves shooting his bow. And you don't do that with a crossbow. You don't, NP, I mean, I'm not saying it's not enjoyable. I'm, what I'm saying is that when you're flinging eight arrows at a time down at a target at 50 yards and you're watching the flight of the arrow and you're improving your skills, that's fun. It's, it's therapeutic. And it's, there's a great level of enjoyment. So I don't, I don't think we're going to lose that anytime soon. Plus, a lot of people like using compounds. But they're fighting words. I've seen it almost cause fights in a bar where people be made fun of because they use a crossbow. And I've seen it on this channel. I have a crossbow versus compound video. And people largely support the crossbows. But I want to look at it a little bit different. You know, like we go to properties all the time. We're setting up bow shots. That's generally what we do. We're setting up bow shots. I can say with a crossbow, instead of setting up a 25-yard, 23-yard bow shot, you might be comfortable at 30, 32 yards. But we're not talking 50. That's not where the capability lies. It's look... If this person's a crossbow only hunter and he's the only one on the land that's gonna hunt, there's no one else using a vertical bow, you know, we might set up a shot for 30 to be in that wheelhouse, but we're not setting up a 40 yard shot because too many things could happen. The arrow's not that much faster, it's louder. They react to a crossbow more, so there's they're not as much more capable as people think. I, I, I see people refer to them as they should only be using shotgun season. Boy, that's ignorant. You know, really, they're, they're so different than a shotgun. A shotgun, a good shotgun person, heck, muzzleloader, I've shot deer out to 254 yards with a muzzleloader. It's not a crossbow, folks. A huge difference between muzzleloader, shotgun, crossbow, and their capabilities. It's a lot closer to a bow, compound, and think about it when compounds took over stick bows and traditional archery. About the same. 
you know, I don't see most traditional archers, you know, a lot of them have been compound and gone back. They just want to be a little bit more natural. Well, bottom line is what I have seen with crossbows is get kids and new hunters into the sport. Kids earlier and then new hunters into the sport because they wouldn't have tried a vertical bow. They didn't want to go out when it was cold. They don't like guns, whatever it might be. You know, we have a sport that there's dwindling numbers, a number shrink. And then we have states like Minnesota that won't allow someone to use a crossbow just generally. And people think, I mean, probably 50% of the people here, 60% say, oh, that's great. We're not allowing them to use crossbows. You don't like hunter recruitment? You don't like hunter retainment? What about those people that can't shoot a vertical bow? They're in their 40s. They haven't been doing it for seven years. They want to go hunting, but they know they don't have the time to practice. Is it bad if they pick up a crossbow and we count them as a hunter? I don't think so. Think about the big picture of what it how it positively affects the sport. I've seen a lot of people, I, I can tell you almost every client, and some client's gonna bring this up this year to me, I'm sure, because I, I've talked about this. Almost every client that uses a crossbow makes an excuse. Absolutely, 100% of them do. It's, and that's so unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely. Because the general hunting public, you out there, some of you, have made them feel so guilty and inferior because they use a crossbow that when we come to their property, they feel inclined to make an excuse of why they're using it. And that's a shame, shame on you if you made them do that. Not you, Dylan, but you know. <laughs> I, I pointed right at now. Dylan, yeah. <laughs> I pointed at the camera, the camera's blocking what the point, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, it's it's uh, really unfortunate. Think about that, they're a hunter. They care about the wildlife. They might even care more about it than you. They might improve their habitat. They might work on the land harder than you do. They might make it more of a passion and a priority in their life. You know they don't have as much money as you, but you're cutting them down because they use a crossbow. Come on, shame on you. Bottom line is, I've seen it get people into hunting that would have never gotten, in, gotten into hunting otherwise. The crossbow in Wisconsin. You can use a crossbow. And you know what those people did eventually? They migrated to a vertical bow, even though they started with a crossbow. Is that really a bad thing? It's a stepping stone. You know, if you're traditional, if you're most of your hunters in your group use a vertical bow, and this person over here is just getting into it, and they want to use a crossbow, and that's a choice of getting into hunting or not, shame on you if you make them feel guilty and they don't get into hunting because that's not what you do in your elitist group. That's all we'll say about it. Minnesota's really behind on this. And I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I'm a part of the state at the moment when they don't offer something that gets new hunters into the sport or experienced hunters back into the sport or keeps people into the sport. And that's, that's a shame, shame on Minnesota. Baiting, I don't care what you do about baiting. You know, it's another one of those things because I've seen coming from the state of Michigan when everyone was baiting in the UP of Michigan, it used to be when it was legal and in Northern Michigan, I've seen how it hurts people way more than it helps them. For one, they're waiting till the last 10 minutes of light for hopes of seeing a buck. When someone else is not using baiting a half a mile away, I can think of uh, 2006, I'd seen uh, um, 11 bucks that I passed up and I shot two and I had 17 bucks on camera, yet someone who's bait hunting, and I hunted public land all around them, and someone who's bait hunting over here on public land saw one four point that I'd passed up and shot it during the second week of his two weeks off, and it was the only buck he saw coming into his bait pile. The same bait pile that 2006 marked the 30 year anniversary of staring at the same bait pile on public land in the same spot. He enjoyed that, that was his time off. That's why I'm saying, if you want to bait, I don't really care. But bottom line is you got to understand that when he blamed the wolves, the sugar beaters from downstate and all the doe tags and people shooting does, and that's why he's not seeing deer. No, it's because he didn't do something different. If you always get what you've always had, you always get what you had or something like that. Yeah, you were close. <laughs> I was close. <laughs> I always mess that up too. It's like I need to change. But I've only heard you say it correctly once or twice. <laughs> Come on, Dylan. <laughs> If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you had. There we go. Something like All that. Right. But bottom line is, there's people complaining about the hunt or the herd or the DNR or sugar beaters, meaning they're the people that came from below the bridge, which are also called trolls, and then came up to the UP and hunted and, and baited. Sugar beating, meaning they threw out sugar beets. And when bottom line is, they just didn't change what they were doing. And for 30 years, they stared at the same bait pile for either a one week or two weeks off of their vacation. What did they learn? Other than if they're reading a book or a magazine, what did they learn about hunting? They weren't out scouting, looking for a new sign, looking for new spots. 
like Dylan, you know, we talked about with public land that he had eight spots in South Dakota this year. And I bet you next year will be 12, 15 spots. They're separate spots so that if this one's dead, you can go look at this one. Keep looking for fresh sign. Keep learning. What you do when, you're, when you keep moving, you keep learning. When you sit, staring at a bay pile, you don't learn. And so I don't mind the topics of being ethical, that kind of thing. But think about a lot of people that are baiting. If you don't like baiting, they're just hurting themselves, you know. Now, if people have a bait pile and they manage it well, so the deer never know that you're hunting them, that come into the bait pile, you manage your scent, you manage your access, you manage in and out of your blinds and stands so you're not spooking deer, that's a completely different story. That, that person's a predator. They're putting bait out to attract something and they're not spooking what they're attracting. That's what we do, we spook stuff. They go into an ATV, park at their blind, wonder why they're not seeing deer. I'm not saying all bait hunters are like that. But again, kind of like the cell cams, they can hurt, and they probably hurt way more people that bait as far as their potential level of success that I've seen. I've seen this over and over again than actually using it. And again, though, they're all hunters. That's why I don't really care if someone uses bait. I mean, heck, when I was up, up in the UP in Michigan, people that used bait, that was a good thing because they were probably spooking their, I would say 95% were spooking out their bait piles. That meant the deer weren't coming after until after dark. That meant whatever I was hunting, whatever level of attraction or bedding areas that related to what I do, daylight. Completely different. Then go out there and you could follow tracks. That's how I found out where bait piles were on public land because I'd go out there after dark with a flashlight and I'd follow the tracks. Bait pile, bait pile, bait, bait pile. You're almost hunting people as much as you are deer because those people influence where you should hunt and where you should hunt on public land, how you should access, make sure you can find unbroken, unpressured pockets of cover that you could find deer during daylight hours. And that's the problem with a lot of the baiting. Is it ethical? It's up for debate. I think it is. It's legal. Just because something's legal doesn't mean it's ethical. You're back up to that. But bottom line is, they're all hunters. And you could take advantage of that. You know, I love going up the UP in Michigan and, and hunting some of those areas. And I'll try to put myself a mile away from anybody who's baiting and coming in because then I'm finding a pocket where I can shoot a 150 inch eight point. <laughs> Not a 250 inch eight point. I don't know, if, I don't think that exists even on a game farm. No, I don't think so. Yeah, so that's, that'd be an exaggeration. <laughs> And it wasn't 150, it was actually 148. So I guess I was exaggerating, but it was pushing 150. It was close. It was close. But anyways, it's, you know, we have these buzzwords, we have these fight words. And, you know, I think almost we're losing the battle overall in the country. It doesn't matter if it's guns, it doesn't matter if it's hunting. It's a shrinking percentage of the population. And there are people that want to take that passion and joy away from we're fighting about someone using a traditional bow versus a compound versus a crossbow versus a cell cam versus a regular trail camera, baiting or not baiting. We focus sometimes on those more than we should be focusing on the real fight, which is maintaining our right and our rights to own weapons, hunt, bear arms, and enjoy the freedoms that we have in this country as it seems they're slowly being eroded away. I urge everyone out there to really check out my web classes. They've been wildly successful. We have one that details how you should design your land, another one that details how you should plant and maintain and manage a food plot program. How can you make those decisions that fit your land specifically and not someone else's? Unfortunately, there's so much information in the hunting industry that says you should do this, but it doesn't apply to you. These web classes directly apply to you and then we have our third web class that came out last year, rut web class, navigating the entire rut. And then we have our fourth one coming out, which is hunting hills and thermals. I urge you to check those out, try the web classes, and they're all about teaching, helping you understand how you can navigate, not only managing your property, food plots, and the rut, but also hunting, hunting strategically, hills, thermals, and wherever you pursue whitetails for your dream and your passion.